Hi, everybody. Welcome to Craft. Here we are. It is Wednesday, October 28th, 7 here on the East Coast, 4 p.m. over on the West Coast. And our guest is joining us from lovely West Seattle in Washington. Uh, hi, Claudia. Hi, Denise. I'm so glad to be here. And thanks to everyone for listening in. Yeah, thanks everybody for, for joining us this evening. Um, this is a real, this is a real treat. This is Claudia is another one of those wonderful people that I was really looking forward to hosting here in Seattle, uh, here in Asheville. Um, I'm in Asheville. Claudia is in Seattle. I'm in Asheville. <laughs> on the internet. In the same space. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with craft, this was meant to be an in-person event. It was held at a lovely little speakeasy here in Asheville called Little Jumbo. And it was wonderful. Uh, we were in person with each other. Uh, it was very laid back, relaxed setting. And uh, Little Jumbo's co-owner, Shaw Gray, every time we had a craft event, would craft a specialty cocktail inspired by the guest author or some aspect of the guest author's life or work. Um, despite the fact that sadly, uh, and Claudia was supposed to come to Asheville to join me in person here, and she will, she will at some point. Um, despite that, lovely Shaw Gray from Little Jumbo has still come through every week as we've been trying to shift craft online. Um, and he has crafted a very lovely, exciting uh, cocktail in honor of Claudia tonight. I think it's a very, very good one. I'm excited to share it with you. I will do that about halfway through the hour. Um, before we get started, I will give you a little tour of the screen in case you haven't crowdcasted before. On uh, your right-hand side, you'll see the chat. People are already participating. Yay. Um, if you have a question, you don't need to put it in the chat. There's a lovely little ask a question button right down there at the bottom, and you can enter your question, and uh, or you can simply vote up or down a question that somebody else has asked. Um, and then we just keep all the questions corralled there. As we talk, things might come up, um, different authors, different events, different places. Uh, we will occasionally, I have, I have Mr. Joe, my husband lurking in the background. He will add appropriate links uh, in the chat if that is necessary. After all of this is done, this will live permanently on my Crowdcast page. So if you ever just wanted to come right back to this link, you can rewatch it at any time. Uh, it will also be on my YouTube channel. And um, oh, and I will send out a recap as well. So I, you will all get an email that'll have things that came up during the conversation where you can learn more about Claudia's work um, and maybe where to find special ingredients that are in the cocktail, uh, things of that nature. That, uh, also, yeah. The cocktail, the cocktail. It's a good one. <laughs> I'm actually very, I don't want to, I don't want to speak ill of any of the other wonderful cocktails that Shaw has gone out of his way to create for me. But um, I really like this one a lot, actually. Um, and also we have down below, um, I didn't do any polls today. Sorry. Uh, if one occurs to me in the middle of this, I'll, I'll start one. We are, you see a button, a green button that says order signed books by Claudia and Denise. Um, how is that possible, signed books? Here is how that is possible. If you click on that link, it takes you to lovely Malaprops Bookstore Cafe, the independent bookstore here in Asheville, North Carolina, that has helped spawn, helped me get craft off the ground with Little Jumbo. Um, they are delightful and wonderful, and as we all know, independent businesses in general and independent bookstores especially really need your support right now. So if you are so moved to order uh, any of my books or any of Claudia's books from Malaprops, please do. Independent bookstore of your choice, please do. Uh, or, or you don't have to at all. But the signed part, uh, if you do order and you indicate that you want a signed book, um, we have signed book plates and basically Malaprops will get Claudia or I to sign a book plate for you and they will ship your book out to you uh, completely signed and autographed. So that's not something you can get everywhere on the interwebs. So that's that's what that's what Malaprops does for this for us and they love us for it. Um, okay that's about it. So we're going to talk for about a half hour, share a delightful cocktail recipe. 
Uh, and we're going to make sure we leave uh, plenty of time for for questions because I know a lot of uh, Claudia's Claudia's readers and fans are on this. And um, also, it's just there's a lot of really good. We have similar journalism backgrounds. There's a lot of good stuff that's going to come up, so it'll be it'll be lots of fun. So first of all, I have a very mundane but interesting question because I'm always fascinated by you know what the publishing business does or or doesn't do. So. Um, your book, The Spider and the Fly, when it came out in hardcover, do you know where I'm going to go with this? Maybe. Maybe. The subtitle was oh. a, reporter, a Serial Killer and the Meaning of Murder. But when you get the paperback, it was a writer, a murderer, and a story of obsession. Right. Do tell. Now my you know, you know how like people think that you know you, writers have complete control over their titles and their subtitles and their covers and look not you know not always. It's a good question. Um, so the the blunt mundane answer is that Harper Collins just decided to make a change on the paperback subtitle. I don't even think they told me about it if I'm think remembering correctly. Um, Classic. So, <laughs> I mean, the and the fly is mine. Um, and we sort of wrestled around with the initial subtitle. Um, I wanted something that said to the world, this is a memoir, and that sure. didn't didn't get on there. Um, I think it would have helped with people's expectations going in. But uh, be that as it may, they they also switched it from a black cover to a white cover. They're just trying yeah. to rejigger anything they could to get new eyes on it. It was um it came out um it was it was very similar to what you're facing with your book coming out right in the middle of this maelstrom because yeah. mine was supposed to come out right during the election in 2016. Yep. Um, it was supposed to come out in fall 2016, and they saw what was happening in our world and said, yeah, let's just, just, just get away from that chaos and that noise. But of course, the noise only got louder and louder and louder till what? this din of <laughs> the current din. Um, so I feel you. I feel for you. I know what you're doing. <laughs> so when were you surprised? Like, when did you find out they had changed? Which which subtitle do you prefer, and when did you find out they had changed it? Um, I think I probably prefer the first, which is a little more um, maybe it's a little more oblique. I think they thought the word obsession was a little more hot or commercial. It is accurate. Um, uh, when did I find out? I think I found out when they shipped me when a bunch of paperbacks. Yeah. yeah. That sounds about that sounds about right for publishing. Um, the uh, spider and the fly was always your spider and the fly was always your uh, always your title, correct? Well, it was um, no, it wasn't. Um, when I was working on the book before before it was sort of in the world of publishing, when I was just working on it myself. I was calling it, what was I, I was calling it evidence of things not seen, um, which is a biblical quote, which is in the book. Um, and it is a quote about faith. Um, but the, uh, my foil in the book, the killer who, who I sort of go up against, he had, he had used this quote about faith in his high school yearbook. Uh, um, faith is this and faith is that. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Of course, I thought that the whole story was evidence of all kinds of things unseen. So I really liked that. I think it was, again, a little too floaty and oblique for some. Also, I came to discover that there was a book about the Atlanta child murders by, I think it was, it was a book or an article, I think by James Baldwin, also called Evidence of Things Not Seen, and I certainly was not gonna go up against him. So, um, so, we, so they said, you know, Come up with something else, and um, I like the spider and the fly. I think it. I think it. Oh, I do too. I think it works. Oh yeah, yeah, it totally works. So um, for those uh, attending, because I know there's some people who are, um, I've heard from some people who are coming to your work fresh, um, without 
going into too much, and I, and it's, you know, I'm sure they, I'm sure they've read about you already online and the little blurb I did about you um, when we uh, advertised this event. Just give a little overview of, of what this, of what this book is about. Sure. Um, the book is nominally about the sort of quest of a young reporter, me. This is a memoir, and it is completely true. I'll just say that if it's not clear to anyone, um, this is a true story. The book w uh, begins with this sort of young, um, a bit of a drift, uh, young woman, me, uh, as a younger reporter um, out in rural New York State, and this incredibly sensational sensational story of a serial killer kind of lands in my lap. Um, the now, see, I'm, not, I'm already going to interrupt you. So I want you to just describe, it's 1998. Uh, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. So talk a little bit about who you were, who you were in 1998 and what you were doing. You know, who was this reporter who was about to stumble into this into this story? I was, uh, uh, I had been raised in New York City and I was kind of fleeing. I was kind of hiding out in the woods of Dutchess County and I was at that point a stringer for the New York Times. I had worked- oh, explain, oh, you must explain for the non-journos here, the, the, the exquisite pain that is stringing. Sure. I yes. had been, I had been, you know, regular reporter at this, at the local paper, which was the Poughkeepsie Journal. Um, and then I quit that paper, very disillusioned about journalism. And as things go, sort of picked up work stringing for the New York Times, which means that they call you up and they say, can you cover this? Can you run and cover this story? Can you write it all up and give it to us and then get no credit for it? Um, in those days, stringers rarely got, oh, by rule at the New York Times, you know, you did not get a byline. I actually did get bylines um, on some stories. And in certain sections of the paper, you got no byline and in others you did. But it was, um, just to get back to your original question, it was fine for me because that's a big get. That's a big get when you're an up and comer, up and, up and coming journalist. To it was big. It was that's very big. big. And yeah. you know, as I say, I certainly had plenty of bylines in the New York Times, many, and I did contribute to that paper for seven years. And I'm, you know, it was a good thing for me. Um, and I had established a relationship with them by the time this enormous story broke. I had um, covered. Uh, New York State's second death penalty case since that law was reinstated. You know, I was sort of developing like a, a pretty good reputation with them as, as a reliable person. And of course, this was Dutchess County, New York. It's only an hour and a half from New York City. So there were many, many New York Times readers who had second homes there. So they got used to me and they said, well, what else you got? What's going on? And and before anything had happened with this with this case, I said, well, well, I don't really know. I, I There's all these women and they're missing and it's been going on for years and the local paper is not covering it. There was one teeny blurb after the first woman, um, but there were no stories at the, at the time that this editor at the New York Times, Jim Roberts, asked me what, what's going on. And I said, I really don't know if this is a story, but there's definitely something going on. And he How said- How many people had gone missing by that point? At that point, it was- six or seven okay um and this has been for two things. years yeah okay and he's like <laughs> girl get on it like start making some phone calls so uh i did and i was calling these were all women who had um drug habits and were supporting those habits by um street walking in downtown poughkeepsie so they were they were uh, using prostitution to support their habits, and and they were um, pretty pretty atrociously maligned um, by the sort of Dutchess County community, uh, community, which is a other than Poughkeepsie itself, Dutchess County is this sort of fairly wealthy, very white, uh, generally Republican leaning um, kind of horse country, very beautiful 
And then you have this sort of um, city in the middle of it all, which is just this hotbed of social problems and horrible schools and high dropout rates and this ongoing longstanding problem of a pretty serious drug trade um, and a whole bunch of other stuff going on in the city of Poughkeepsie, which the rest of Dutchess County avoided like a plague. So these women are missing, but they're sort of the wrong kind of victim, right? They're not really pretty and they definitely do the wrong kind of work and they're not soccer moms. And police said to me straight up, really um, unapologetically, yeah, if this was, you know, Vassar girls, Vassar is in Poughkeepsie, if this was Vassar girls missing, the whole thing, you know, would be different, but that's not who's missing. So um, I started making phone calls and talking to these women's um, boyfriends and families, and within a week, um, a guy confessed having nothing to do with what I was doing. It was just a bizarre confluence of events. I was sort of jumping up and down about this and um, Kendall Francois in his own strange way was, I guess, coming to the end of some sort of rope. Um, and we can talk about that. Anyway, uh, so there I was um, in this town. To be quite frank, I was pretty estranged from my family. Like I said, I was sort of hiding out from my past a little bit and kind of existing or subsisting really at a, at a sort of pretty low level. You know, I was paying my rent by stringing for the New York Times, but I wasn't really building much, you know, and I had always had this um, feeling when I worked for the Poughkeepsie Journal, which became a, a worse and worse experience for me. And many young reporters will recognize sort of hypocrisy and compromises and all, and all stuff that happens when you're a young reporter. And uh, I had this feeling about hypocrisy. There was something about this kind of boosterism um, of, the, of the local paper that was me not taking a really honest look at the realities in this small city, Poughkeepsie. Um, so I had this idea about hypocrisy and I wanted to write about it, but I didn't really know how I had a lot of, you know, I wanted to be a writer, but I was a reporter and is a reporter, a writer. And I had all these struggles around identity and are you worth anything and what the fuck are you doing? And sorry, all that. Oh, no, no apologies for salty language on this show. Um, were, uh, how, long, how long had you been actually writing when this came to you? I had been a reporter since 1992, where I started in the Bronx. Um, so, yeah, so fewer than 10 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, I was, yeah what, you know, I was still a baby reporter. Um, and this sort of explosive thing just like landed and I was already on it. I had already cultivated some, some sources. Um, so I was sort of ahead when I was literally go into the chief of detectives office that very morning for an interview. I didn't know there had been an arrest. I didn't know anything. I was going to his office at 9 a.m. for our arranged interview. And he just, he didn't even say anything. He just handed me this little slip of paper and it had an address on it. And it was Kendall Francois's home. And he said, go. And I, that was it. And I got in my car. And meanwhile, like 48 hours and all the news trucks are, are assembling and it's this, melee in front of the house. It's just crowds of people and news and, you know, people in Poughkeepsie and passersby. And it was just, a, it was nuts. And, and I am. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that you've gone from, you've gone from, and you haven't even talked to him yet, but you've gone from the paper saying, you should get on this. And you're like, I'm not sure if there's a story there to 48 hours and, you know, all of this sort of Oh yeah, it was a huge story. And uh, this will be, this is no spoiler to those listening. It was a huge story because there were um, eight corpses in the family home. So Kendall Francois was a young man. He was 27 at this point, young um, black man who lived in um, this lovely neighborhood right down the street from Vassar College with his uh, mom and dad and teenage sister. And there were eight women's corpses in the house. All the victims were white women. He, the families, as I said, black families. So there was all this question about what is this? What is this? And how could? And the family said they didn't know. And there were 
you know, this had gone on for two years. Some of these bodies were pretty well decayed. I mean, it was it was a really unusually extreme crime scene, even among extreme crimes. Uh, uh, you know, the, like I said, that that chief of detectives told me in 30 years he had never seen a crime scene like it. Um, it was extreme. They were hoarders. So, so in addition to whatever else was in the, the house, these women, the bodies, uh, yeah. you know, there it was just chaos in the house. It was, you know, uh, just like the bathrooms didn't work and there were maggots dropping from the ceiling. And I mean, and there was like underwear in the kitchen and, and, and dishes with decayed food. I mean, it was like really extreme. And these people, this family went out into the world and had, you know, like regular lives. Mom worked as a psychiatric nurse and the dad was uh, like a plant manager at DuPont. And the teenage sister was an excellent student at the almost all white high school where Kendall Francois himself had, had previously been a student. I mean, they had sort of regular lives out in the world and um, yet this this incredible dysfunction existing, you know, behind closed doors. So naturally, in my obsession with the hypocrisy of Poughkeepsie, I suddenly saw sort of these layers of reality outside being very different from reality inside and the and the did purported you, did you see that right off because i'm trying to like you know you that sort of struck you struck you immediately or were you like oh great somebody's confessed there goes my story no 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 i as soon as i i uh as soon as i kind of had a sense of what this is uh, what what this was with this the situation of this house and then this kind of outside of the house reality that this family was living to me it lined up so clearly with not only what I thought about you know this kind of manicured or, or curated vision of Poughkeepsie and Dutchess County that the paper was putting out there there's a lot about hypocrisy of journalism in this book sure. um so to me, it lined right up with what I had sort of been feeling all along about the picture that the paper was putting out and the reality that I knew from living there um, as, you know, and then this family was sort of living this existence outside, but there was a different truth inside. And to be, to bring it all home and why this is a memoir is that that was not unlike my own family, right? My own family um, looked all good on the outside and and sort of upper middle class um manhattan life but it was not like that inside at all so um these kind of concentric circles these kind of rippling parallelisms of what's true inside and and how different that is from what's what's projected outside that was clear to me almost immediately and so then, um, then I became. Did you think, did you think the because you were you were a stringer for the New York Times, and usually when you're a stringer for a newspaper, barely getting bylines, going into an editor talking about concentric circles of hypocrisy is not the kind of story they often want to hear from a young and up, up and coming reporter. No. So were you sitting there thinking, I have just got to do this no matter what, or were you actively trying to? get pieces of this as you found pieces of the story did you ever think like i'm going to do this as a serial did you went in other words from a from a from a writer's standpoint because i'm always interested in like the decision making that goes into storytelling mm -hmm. and if you're trained in journalism one of the things that um and i i, I feel like I, I i talk about this all the time probably because i still think it's a real challenge you get so curious about something and then you think, well, is it really a story? Which is actually one of the first questions you, one of the first things you said to your editor. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it's really a story. Then you're like, okay, it is a story. And, but what kind of story, but what, you know, is this a feature? Is this a, you know, 300 word front of the book kind of, you know, toss off? Is this something that could be longer? Should I try to pitch a magazine where I can get a few thousand words? Or, oh my God, should I consider doing this as a book? So do you remember, I know it was a while ago, but that kind of decision-making, because this book took you on, to say the least, this book is a journey for you. 
Yeah. And uh, which is what makes it so compelling to read. Um, so I'm curious about the decision making process strictly from your from your writer's brain. Standing in front of that house that morning of the arrest, um, as I was describing, as all these sort of people and news crews are uh, assembling, it was extremely hot. It was September 1st, I believe, um, September 1st, 1998, maybe September 2nd, but it was extremely hot. It was still kind of summer in the Hudson Valley, and I was shivering. It was hot, humid, and I was literally uh, shivering, and I just, um, I knew, I knew, right, this is your book. I felt it on the sidewalk looking at the house, like, this is your book. You'll do what you do for the New York Times. You'll cover the story like how they want it to be. And it was immediately clear to me, these are two separate things happening. I'll cover- That's the amazing. Story. That's amazing to me. That kind of, that's, I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a rare and wonderful occurrence when that happens. It when, was frightening. I mean, it was, I knew it, but it was that kind of- Had you always wanted to do books? Yeah, I had always sort of, I was having this sort of um, identity issue of how, you know, journalism for me became kind of a, it was initially my, I always wanted to be a writer and I thought journalism would teach me how, right? It would teach me how to finish, it would teach me how to structure, it would teach me discipline, it would teach me all these um, tools, all these things that I knew that I needed. And, and that was originally why I went into journalism. I wanted to write. I was really interested in sort of social issues. And I thought, oh, this is the fantastic way to do it. I And I didn't want to go to journalism school. I didn't want to go to school anymore. After college, I was done. And I wanted to find a way to be paid to learn to write. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do journalism. And I always had thought of it as a, as a sort of entree into this true goal of mine. But what happened is that it became kind of an addiction and kind of a crutch. As any reporter knows, you do get um, really tied into the cycle of the quick turn, the quick gratification, the quick approval, um, the paycheck. And I was into it. I was good at it and I liked it and I was getting a lot and of- deadlines help for a lot of us. They help for me. You know, I loved journalism um, and I loved it so much that I kept kind of putting off the the big leap. And it, I mean, it is a real leap and it, and it, it, it might not seem like such a vast um, canyon that you need to jump over to start writing books, but it, oh, for me, it really was. Yeah. No, it's a huge one, but also for you, for this to be your first book is i mean this is a, this was a massive massive thing you undertook and not only it's not like you went from journalism to you know you know reportage nonfiction. you went straight to like i'm in it you know i mean you you put like I, I none of this the journalist is not part of the story i'm in this this is too much of, of, about it's as much about me as it is about, I'm learning about myself as I'm digging into this story. Uh, almost. Um, almost. I did, when I first thought I was, I knew right away, I'm gonna write this book. Uh -huh. But I did initially think it's gonna be proper, you know. Um, I'm, I'm back here, yeah. Proper narrative nonfiction and you're not gonna be in it. And it's, it's gonna truly show, you know, how does a murderer get, you know, how, how does this person get created? You know, it was gonna be very kind of traditional literary nonfiction. That was my initial um, vision. But the nature this of- is the other, This is the other thing I love about, this is the other thing I love about writing is, you know, where does the story, where does the story take you? Right. And sometimes people say, this started out as nonfiction, I had to do it as fiction. Uh, for me, Girls of Atomic City started out as fiction, and then it became nonfiction. Hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. And yeah, which a lot of times people go the other way, but I, the, I became too fascinated with the real stories, which is part of it's the journalist in me, you know. Um, but the, when, you, when you are in a story and all of a sudden something clicks and you're like, 
yeah, this has to go this way. You know, it's taking me this way. Do you, because I mean, just to kind of you, they, they start, these bodies start disappearing in 19, it's 1998 when you start hearing about these bodies disappearing. The book comes out in January of 2017. Like this thing was in your life for a very long time. Do you remember at what point you just knew there was no turning back, like the wall was gone and you were in, or did that come later when you were actually taking all the information and all the experiences and starting to actually put the book together? Like, do you remember that occurring to you when you, and I know it was a while ago, but I find this so fascinating. Oh, I remember everything. Um, everything. Good, I love people um, like you. <laughs> uh, so like I said, you know, I had, I had initially planned to be very sort of proper and traditional about my approach. Um, and the nature of my obsession, frankly, was such that I had to begin asking myself, what is this about for you? Why are you like We're willing talking. to destroy your life and, and break up your relationship? Like, what are you doing? What, this is way, way more than a normal kind of inquiry. Like, this is some kind of other thing you're working out here. What is this? That's when it became clear, oh, this is really about you and facing your own demons and standing up to your own fears and looking and standing up to your past. And, you know, Kendall Francois started to become like the embodiment of my past. Um, and that is why it became a memoir. The answer to your question is this book got written in kind of two phases. In 1998, I, when that, the arrest happened, I was still just, you know, good little reporter on the scene doing my good little reporter stuff. And I sort of ruminated about it a lot. And I, I wrote a couple pieces for the New York Times about it. And then in 1999, I wrote my first letter to him. Um, and from that point, like 98 to 2003, I was being totally reporterish about it. I understood about the obsession part, but I was reporting it intensely. And I was a good reporter and I took good notes and all that, but um, it was taking over my life. It was totally overwhelming me. And by, by 2003, I was living like by myself in a shack in the Catskill Mountains talking to no one except a serial murderer who was writing to me. I was estranged from my family. I, you know, the guy I had been living with, we split up. Like I had no friends. It was really getting pretty nuts. And um, I, at that point, was, was wrestling with it. I knew I was writing a book, but all that stuff perpetuated my move to Seattle. And at that point, um, I thought I would finish the book in Seattle. I thought I needed to get away from New York and I would just be in Seattle a couple of months and I would just pull it all together. But uh, the Seattle Post Intelligencer offered me a job, a full-time job covering social issues. And I was like, God, thank God, I just can't do this book. I'm just not equal to it. I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too oh deep. It's too intense. It's too personal. And I honestly didn't believe I had the chops. I didn't believe, I wasn't confident enough in my skills. And I, I was like, all right, you know, this is, this is a hit, but I'll sort of try to take it as a, as a worthwhile experience and, and face forward and be a good reporter. So that in 2003, toward the end of 2003, that's what I did. And I stepped away from the book, um, but I never put, I never put it away. There were notes and boxes of papers and all this crap in my home office for years, for like six years. I never actually physically put it away. I just had it sitting around me for years. And then the Seattle PI closed in 2009. It, it bit the dust. And by then I had, um, you know, gotten married and, and sort of started building a family. And in, and at that point, around 2012, I was one night sitting up in my office, like, and I sort of dared to take a peek at the stack of old notes that had been sitting around me for six years and thought, oh, 
wow, that was a really that that was a really that was a really important story. There were really important themes that never got aired. There was real like wrong stuff happened and it's a big deal and people's lives were changed and hurt and ended and kids were orphaned and you know this is a big big thing and there's a whole police component that never really came out um this is a big deal and i'm gonna do this fucking book and that's when i went back to it for another five years so it was 10 years of writing with sort of an eight year period of laying fallow or something sure yeah well, sometimes, I mean, sometimes books have to, sometimes books, other writing projects have to do that. They yes, have to say, or it's not the right, yeah. What did it finally feel like? Um, oh, well, first of all, when you were pitching the book, was there anyone, did you do a, just do a proposal? Or did you uh, actually, the, the book, right. the was, was there anyone who said, yeah, we don't like the memoir component? Or was there yeah. somebody who was said, no, more memoir? So that's exactly what happened. When I was in, you know, sort of initially immersed in the book in that 1998 to 2003 period, I was doing all the standard pitching. And sure. I kept on getting the same response from agents saying, well, we really like your writing, but, you know, is it this or is it this? Is it true crime or is it memoir? And you know, and one person was like, "Well, it's fascinating, but it's neither fish nor fowl." And and sort the of feathered, the feathered fish. I've heard it called before when I've and, that and, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, essentially pick, choose, and and I I cut, there was no way. I was like, okay, forget it. So I so I backed off that whole endeavor and said, all right, forget it. I'm just going to write this book and it's going to be what it's going to be. And then people can decide then. Um, and so I was, you know, then here we are, fast forward to 2012 and I decided to recommit to it. And I applied for a, um, a grant, a little small grant to do it, tiny. And that grant um, gave me enough money to go back to New York State. I was living in Seattle, of course, and I and I flew back to New York State. It was the first time I had been back since sort of fleeing in, in 2003. Um, and I sort of just wanted to see, like, was I really different? And what had happened in the interim? And what did it all mean? And, you know, now I'm much older and coming back to this sort of you know, scene of the crime and do I see it differently and what does this mean? And when that happened, um, not to give too much away, but I, when yeah. that happened, it um, aligned with a change in the status of Kendall Francois himself. The timing, once again, was this crazy confluence of circumstances. Yep. And um, I, I did something I have never done before or since, which was I came back to Seattle and, and wrote this blurt on Facebook about it, of all things, which I never do. And just this crazy thing happened. And um, fabulous Jenny Shortridge, a, a generous, Woo! brilliant woman said, um, She's a writer, for those who don't know, a fantastic novelist. She's and a, awesome. She's the reason Claudia and I connected. She's, she's awesome. an amazing, amazing person. And Jenny saw my Facebook thing and said, um, I really think you, need, you should be talking to my agent. I think she would be into this. And that was it. It was instant. So um, like my friend says, yes, you know, New, Year, New Year's Eve uh, seems really instant, though it takes a whole year to get to that to the turning of the year. That's sure. what it was. It's it, as soon as it hit, it hit fast. And um, Stephanie Rostin became my agent and she got a deal like within a, a month or something. It was very fast. See that, I, I, I love stories like that. But your tenacity, I mean, one of the, in, you to see, it, it always cracks me up when they're like, well, choose, it has to be this or it has to be this. But the book wouldn't be this one wouldn't be the same without the other i mean because right. your your tenacity and where you go with this is is, is such a key part it, well i mean i'm you know being a writer that's you know also part of what speaks to me like when stories grab onto you and won't sort of let go speaking of letting go so 
what was it like after all that time and all those years and leaving the book and coming back to the back to the book and then you get the book and you know it's done what what i mean what was the letting go process like for you cuz it's hard as a writer anyway to let go of stuff when when you're trying to finish it but i I mean, I've, I've worked on things for a long time, but never anything close to what you experienced with this. So I'm just kind of fascinated about what that was like. What was it like in 2017? Um, it was kind of weird. Um, you know, the book is a much younger me, right? It's a, and even in 2017, I mean, the book is told through the eyes of the person I was in 1998, right? A much younger, more insecure, uh, more confused, sort of tremulous person. So it was bizarre to have like my big statement out in the world where, you know, I was so far from that person by the time the book came out. Um, that's surely what allowed me to write the book, you know, right? Like I, oh, had, yeah. to, I had to grow up to do it. And um, so it was kind of like the way I am, I imagine maybe an, an actor feels when they see themselves on the screen, you know, there it's, the book was like a, a, a picture of me yeah. struggling through a time that was far away. So it was like a character. I wanted the book to read like a novel. And a lot of people have, oh, I yeah. think, uh, felt almost confused when they are like, oh, it's, it's true. It's not it's a true. novel. Yeah, totally. um, I, I very um, specifically set out to make it feel and read like a novel, and so the 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 story is the story of a character, two you know two characters really, me and him and several others. Um, so it it was like seeing this other being out there. I didn't. F it. But it that's was kind of important sometimes, though. If you're if you're when you're writing about yourself, especially about yourself at another stage in your life. I mean, sometimes you need distance from your, you need distance from your characters as a, or your subjects as a journalist anyway. Right. And in this case, you were wearing both hats, right? So you needed, you, Claudia, the, the writer needed distance from Claudia, the 1998 or 2000, 2000, the, that, that reporter, right? Um, that distance helped you shape her story. And the other side, the more sort of writer today side is, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't, when I write journalism, I can't stand to read it ever. Um, I never read my clips. I never go back. I, I, I die when somebody asks me to look at, look up some old piece. And, you know, because the reason is because you, you see things that you don't like, right? You know, oh, I so never do. When people are like, do you want to do a reading? I always say, if, if there is anything else we can do besides force me to reread my own words, I will do that. Right. So when the book came out in 2017, I, I was kind of like, because, you know, it's never what you no. imagine in your dream. It came pretty close. But to be honest, like let's okay i did it it was something i needed to do and i wanted to do and i'm very proud of it but i have new stories to tell so of course yeah you should i mean but you should be incredibly proud of it i mean one of the things that um i i agree with uh with uh shivas here that i hope i pronounced that correctly that oh, Jivas, um, hi. being honest did i say that right um Jivas. being honest about you know the struggle that it is to see a work through to completion is something that so many writers, um, so many writers go through. Act artists of all of all stripes, you know, people that you know, whenever you're dealing with a big project, with a personal project, with a project that makes you look back at a different time in your life, um, as well as you know, bring that project into the you know into the present day, and then just kind of put it out there. For other people i mean it's a huge it's a very brave it's a very brave act it's a very brave book um and you know I, you have continued to you still write about you write about the opioid crisis um you've written about um 
the criminal justice system and juvenile justice. So, I mean, a, a lot of the social issues and, and crime and how crime affects individuals and families, that has, that has been like a continuing theme in your, in your writing life, yes? Definitely. I think of it with the book and with all of and the journalism too, more like um, <clears throat> what does crime show us about who we are um, and, and our communities and what we value and who is deemed worth saving and who is deemed not worth saving. And, and you know, what does crime sort of tell us about ourselves rather than the atrocious act of this person, right? Fine, but what does it tell us about our systems and our communities and our um, sense of value of each other? It's making the crime about you write about crime as though it's not it's not just about the criminal, right? It, it's really about what goes into the like you said the communities from which these criminals evolve. Talk a little right. bit about Time Out. Uh, time Out. Um, time Out is a uh, again, a true story uh, comes out of Seattle. It's about juvenile justice and race. And it is the story of a 13 year old kid who um, was convicted of first degree murder. Some people would say a 13 year old could not qualify. There are a lot of issues with that charge and his conviction. conviction. However, he was convicted of uh, first degree murder in 1994 and received a 23 year sentence in adult prison. This kid is 13 years old. He's a seventh grader. Um, I got to know him. Of course, that happened before I was in Seattle. I was, you know, flailing around Poughkeepsie at that point. Um, but by the time I got out here, this guy's name is Willard Jimerson. And, uh, he had been in prison for a number of years. By the time I got out here, I wanted to write a story when I was at the Seattle PI about what it does to a kid's brain to, to grow up in a box, to grow up locked up. What does it actually do to your brain? So I didn't know anything about the Willard Jimerson story, but I was um, interested in this question because of another case that was happening in, I think about 2005 out here, which involved two very young boys who had killed their playmate. So I was intrigued by that case and I wanted to find a way into it. And my editor said, well, why don't you check out this Willard Jimerson kid? Cause you know, that's what happened to him. Why, he's in prison now, why don't you go talk to him? Why don't you see what happened to him? So that's what I did. I wrote a newspaper story with and about Willard Jimerson. We corresponded for a year and then I wrote this story and that was that, so I thought. But then after The Spider and the Fly came out, you know, I always wanted to do more with the Willard Jimerson story. I just, you know, it was a newspaper piece. I always thought it deserved more. And then when the book came out, Amazon Original Stories was launching this new line of original stories. And they said, hey, Claudia, do you have anything? It was kind of uh, arranged similar to This American Life, like stories that all spoke to a theme and took different angles on a very broad theme. So the theme that they wanted me to look at was missing, the concept of missing. And um, the editor there said, do you have a story that you think kind of fits into this idea of, of missing? And I said, well, yes, I do. There's a kid who missed everything. He's been locked up since he was 13. By this point, he was in his 30s and he had missed all the normal growing up experiences he had you know, like learning to drive and going on a date and paying bills and like any normal kind of experience. And he was going to be getting out, you know, um, by the time this question was posed to me, he had got, he had been released. He served 20 years and he was at that point in his early thirties and he was back in Seattle trying to, you know, live, trying to make a life. Um, so that, that's why uh, Time Out came to be and that's, you can get it on Amazon. And please do, and I'm sure Joe will put the uh, put the links in the uh, put the links in here, and I'll make sure to include that link. Um, and I'm not in that one, folks. It's a very sort of nor more normal, uh, more traditional kind of narrative nonfiction look at the issue of 
um, you know, this is a serious crime. A, a girl was yeah. killed. Willard killed a 14 year old girl. Um, so, y- you know, I guess I would say the best comment that I ever got about that book, it's a short sort of short book, um, was from, a, I think it was a radio news producer who said, what a lot of people say to me, you know, that they go into the stories that I tell with pretty strong attitudes and ideas about, you know, the killer, the criminal in in the story. And that by the time uh, this radio producer came out at the other end, he had really questioned um, his ideas. And, and, and the best thing was, he said, you didn't push me one way or another. The story is told really straight. There's no uh, Claudia Rowe editorializing in this one. It's uh, just here's what happened and trying to convey some kind of portrait of of this guy Willard and and what it means to grow up for 20 years as a kid in a box. It's uh, yeah, it's great. We will absolutely be sure to include those links in the in the recap. I could, um, I thought we were going to stop talking about 20 minutes ago and then go yeah. on. But um, I could keep talking. Mean, no, no, I could keep, yeah, I, I could talk to you about a million. I, I, there's like half a page of questions I'm not getting to. Before we go to questions, it's time for Claudia's cocktail. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. This is a good one. Again, fantastic shawl, gray, at Little Jumbo came up with this one. So appropriate. The corpse reviver. We've the all been there. Reviver. Um, this is this is based on a real, the, so Shawl and Little Jumbo, it is a classic cocktail bar. They take cocktail recipes going back to the 17 and 1800s. They come up with their own, but they also do modern day tweaks on very old classics. Um, and when I was sharing his writing and he's an avid reader, which is why this whole craft was such a, such a great location for craft to be at Little Jumbo. Um, he was like, oh, I know which one I want. Like, that was one of the first ones. He was like, oh, I know what I'm going to do for that one. So um, here's your cocktail. And uh, I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, and that will be, again, like when you rewatch this, you can see it here, you can see it on YouTube. And eventually after, after all these, these will all live, uh, also permanently on my, on my website, but the corpse reviver delicious and anything that has a little touch of absinthe in it is, you know, that's, that's, that's always a favorite of mine. Um, okay. Let's see what the questions are. Claudia. Yes. What was the most horrifying thing you learned about yourself during during the process of getting to know a mass murderer? Mm, good one. That's a hard uh, question to answer. I think that the whole process was about confronting weakness and about having to um, face moments when I was less than honest and uh, weakness about, you know, what does it take to stand up, to stand up to this guy, to stand up to my past, to stand up to who I really was. I had to, I think the the hardest thing I learned about myself was that I, I wasn't who I wanted to be. I wasn't the strong, tough, brilliant, you know, <laughs> swashbuckler. I was actually quite frightened and um, confused and that I had to kind of, kind of own that, kind of admit that. That's and what's so interesting about that is that, uh, you know, Poughkeepsie is presenting an image that needs to be, you know, taken, you know, taken that you were interested in, like, you know, stripping away. Right. Um, the 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 Francois House, same thing. Mm-hmm an image, a neighborhood that was belying something else going on. And then you find yourself as well. There was an image that you had of yourself that you begin to strip away. The other thing was, um, it, it was very difficult to reconcile the fact that this killer of at least eight women 
who everyone called a monster and surely was monstrous, it was very difficult to, to try to understand what had made him the person that he was while the line between sort of compassion and understanding was very, very difficult to navigate. And I didn't want to negate what he had done, but I did want to understand what had brought him to that point. And, Contextualization, yeah. And the um, impulse of, say, the man I was then living with and everybody who knew me, everybody, my family, everyone like thought I was crazy to go this far and go this deep. And, um, you know, the, the more comfortable place to be is to say, this guy is a monster and he doesn't deserve to be understood. And he certainly doesn't deserve to be understood by a person like you, said said my then boyfriend. Um, to to kind of walk- Emphasis on then. Sorry? I said emphasis on then. Right, very much <laughs> then. Um, uh, the, to walk that line of trying to understand and have compassion for the truth of what I was learning, but not forgive, but understand was, was difficult. It's, it's the, it's the, the line between compa compassion and contextualization while not offering is different than excuses. Right. Right. Yeah. The other thing was, you know, this guy, while he was all kinds of crazy, was not completely uh, blind. And he started, he often said things to me about journalism, about me, um, about Poughkeepsie, about families, and about friendship that were painfully true and that I related to. Um, I had felt very much betrayed by friends and people in my past. He, he spoke about that all the time in his own life. So to feel like I was sort of identifying at a human level with things that this person was saying was really difficult because, you know, he's a prize manipulator, right? Like everything he's saying is, is to manipulate and yet some of it was va quite valid. Um, so it was quite it was a lot of turmoil and figuring it all out. Well, it's that's why I mean that's that's part of the reason the book is is what the is what the book is. Um, how do you know? Oh, Jenny, how do you know both of you when you have a great topic to explore in book length form rather than say a short form article? Well, Jenny, my darling, isn't that always the question? Um, I don't know about that. To me, remains one of the um, one of the more challenging things to face. And I keep I keep obsessive amounts of idea files, and um, and it, they used to be all written by hand. And then I would have post-it boards, and some were in journals, and then there would be computer files, and sometimes it's just photos, like photos I saw that made me think I want to look into this. And sometimes I would go back to things and and just go, whew, that's a horrible, horrible, horrible idea. Um, and then other times you go back to things and the time has passed. Sometimes you go back to things, you're looking at things and it wasn't the right time. In your case, you went back to something and it was like, oh no, the time is now. So, I mean, some, it's a question of timing for some things. Um, a gut, it ha, for me, it has to be, if it's gonna be long form, it has to be something I am really continuously curious about. It can't be something I just, because it lives with you, as, as you know, in some cases, a very long time, but it stays with you for a long, even, you know, even, you know, the normal run of, of a book you set out to do, you know, it's, it's in your life for, for, for years. And um, the, so if I know something, something to me has to be, I guess, have layers for it to be long form. It can't oh. just be about one thing. There have to be layers. And I like when there are intersections between events and what I would call sort of like thematic shifts in culture. Um, so anything that, 
anything it can't just be about um and this is nothing again biographies are very valuable but like i don't ever want to write a biography really it's not my there are there are characters in my books that are focused on but i'm more the things that grab me are are different cultural layers and like sort of shifts in shifts in history and but you had said used a phrase earlier um claudia that i use sometimes which is like finding the way in and sometimes like i can amass a whole bunch of information about a time period or an event or this aspect of history that i think hasn't been covered at all but if i don't have the right way in it's just i've got to have the way in because i've got to stay in there I've got, it's got to keep my interest for a long time. What about, what about you? How do you decide what's going to be short form, long form? Um, same thing, layers for sure. Um, Cause there's, you know, dimension, right? As you alluded to earlier, you can't be like trying to show concentric circles of meaning in a 800 word newspaper story, or even right. really a 5,000 word. word it, it needs to stretch out and it needs to breathe when it's got those, that kind of dimension or yeah. layer. Um, also obsession. I mean, you know, sure. if you write something and then you feel satisfied, then if you write, you know, a short piece or a summary or a pitch or a whatever, um, and you feel satisfied, then you, then you're satisfied. But I tend to, um, you know, uh, obsessions definitely grab me, and I've learned to um, listen to that and obey that. And, and if, if you talk about like needing the with the longer, the longer form books that I do with every, with every one, like, and, I, and I'm like you, I don't go back and read things, but when they cross my mind or when I'm doing an interview and asked about them or something like that, there are always like immediately like the list of things I wish I would have added or the list of things I wish I would have, you know, done differently or the list of things I wish I could have just looked into a little more deeply. Um, so, so yeah, the, the hook, the hook has to be there. The obsession, the obsession has to be there. Um, it's already been an hour. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. And thanks this to the awesome. for that drink. I can't wait. I'm, I'm you gonna... have to come here. Um, you have to come here. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, for showing up and joining us um, someday we'll all be together <laughs> somewhere you'll be here i'll come there everybody uh, vote i'm sure all of you have voted but yes, vote. if you have, and if you haven't voted go do it um and uh craft is going on a little bit of a hiatus because i've got to do a whole bunch more of this uh for my book which comes out november 10th i would be very remiss if i did not tell people i had a book coming out november 10th Everybody but, um, go get Denise's book. It's so timely. We get, you guys probably all know, we gather together. It, it's like, it's the perfect time. We need it. Whatever happens, you know, next week, we need it either way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to, to writers and readers and everybody who does this. Craft will be back probably, uh, I don't know, either early December or early January. No later than early January for sure. Um, and then it'll be back live, well, someday. Uh, until then, uh, thank you to Malaprops, uh, who, who always makes the books uh, available. Thank you, uh, Malaprops. Thank, 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 thank you in person as soon as I can. And uh, thank you again to Claudia. Thank you to all of you for showing up. Um, stay safe, be well. And uh, until next time, thank you all so much for coming. Bye.